We are live. I think I'm going to be live. It'll be my last live in the year 2020. Hey, y'all. Hi. Oh, lost my thing already. Hey, everybody that is here. Welcome. Hi. Welcome to Warrior Wednesdays. I see you guys coming in. Oh, thank you so much for joining. Mama Stu is here. I think her normal is here. Nichelle Polston, did I see you? Because you are next Wednesday's guest doll. Hey, everybody. You know what? Something that I've never done before, as I see you guys come in and give all these waves. Um, where are you from? Can you like type to me and to our guests today, Dontara Terrell and Lynn Wachter, so we know where you are joining us from. Hello, Phenomenally Autistic. Uh, great to see you, Yanni. Nichelle Polston, like I said, you guys, check out hernormal.com. Nichelle and I, we have some fun things coming up for you in uh, 2021, but she has a really great uh, website and blog site, and she'll be joining us with her fertility story next Wednesday. So come New Orleans. What's up? Mel Pierre from New Orleans. That's beautiful. I love it there. I love the food. Orange County, California. How you doing, Sassy Coley? Welcome, everybody that's coming in. Let me know where else you're from. Delaware. <laughs> I'm in Philly, so what's up, Delaware? Nashville. I love it. If my woman crush was, okay, class of 1995, you might be a little young for me, but that's okay. Uh, Toronto. What's up, Canada? One of my favorite places to be. So thank you for letting me know where you guys are from. Somebody's joining from Philly. I know that's Michelle Poston. Um, Courtney Gift says, I work for a fertility provider and obsessed with your journey. Thank you for working with a fertility provider because we need that. So thank you for saying that. Atlanta, what's up? I see you're in the building. Virginia's in the building. Georgia's in the building. Jersey is in the building. All right. So now we know that we are all sharing our stories from all walks of life, right? Whether we're in Canada, whether we're in the South, whether we're in the East, whether we're in the West. And I just want to thank you guys for joining us um, on this Wednesday, but every Wednesday that I've been doing this in the year 2020. And today, um, the story is about fibroids. Oh, I see class of 1995 said he's most certainly not too young. He or she. Hello, Savannah, Georgia, what's going up? Um, but it's about fibroids and it is also about emergency surgeries. The two young ladies, Don Tara Terrell and Lynn Wachter that are going to share their stories with you had emergency situations. And at first I thought, well, should we do this at the end of the year? But then I realized that emergencies also are about survival. And we have had quite a year in 2020. And we have survived 2020. If we're still here, if you woke up this morning with breath in your body, with everything that's going on with the pandemic that we are in, you are a survivor. And so I wanted to be able to bring that energy to you. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce who's first up to talk about fibroids. And for those that don't know, fibroids are a benign, meaning a non-cancerous tumor, cancerous tumor, excuse me, non-cancerous tumor that forms in the womb of a woman that forms in the uterus, sometimes within the cavity, sometimes outside of the cavity. And 80% of black women suffer from fibroids. 70% of women of other ethnicities suffer from fibroids. And um, they are the most prevalent pelvic tumor um, in females. And they can cause infertility, they can cause heavy bleeding, they can cause exhaustion, uh, hair loss. And you will see with our two guests, life threatening uh, complications. And so it's extremely important that we talk about this. And we will continue to talk about this, even with Dr. Cindy Duke when she comes on again. But I want to read a little something. Don Tara, who's a friend of mine, if you guys didn't see the article that I wrote on Black Love, um, you guys know all the folks over at Black Love on OWN. I wrote an article um, about turning my pain into purpose with my fertility story. And Don Tara was the lovely lady that edited that article. And um, she also wrote something here for sisters from AARP. It is on um, the post that I put for today, but I also want you guys to like check it out. Fibroids. I learned I had fibroids after I fainted on a flight. Here's what I wish I knew. That's what Don Tara says. I had suffered in silence for years. Fibroids can affect our quality of life, but understanding these three things can help. So without any further ado, 
let me find our beautiful Dontara Terrell, survivor that she is, and tell us all about this ordeal of fainting on a flight, which is very, very scary. But she's here. There she is. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm so great. How are you? Welcome. I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was uh, an amazing introduction. <laughs> hey, well, listen, you know, I, I could go on and read more of this article. And, I, you know, I have read it in full. And I think it's absolutely amazing. But really quickly, let's just talk really quickly with everybody. Everybody, give her some hearts. Give her some. What is that emoji with the, with the strong oh, arm? Oh, strong, yeah. Because <laughs> home, homegirl fainted on a flight, and you see her today oh. <laughs> ready to talk about it. So everyone's saying welcome. Nichelle Paulson saying welcome to you. Some lovely people. Thank you. But Thank you. Very briefly, how we met is that I wrote an article for Black Love, and mm -hmm. you edited that article. And then you reached out to me and wanted to talk a little bit about freezing eggs. Yes. And told me. So we were on the phone for like three hours. We were. We were. We <laughs> Because when I get when I get on a fertility call, I get on a fertility call. Listen, you were schooling me. I'm like, wait, what? Oh my gosh! Like whole notebook full, full of notes. Full, full. And we were on the phone for three hours about that. And then you told me about this experience of um, the fibroids and mm -hmm. fainting on a flight. So I want you to start from the beginning. Um, what were your symptoms prior to you even knowing you had fibroids? Was there anything that was leading you to believe something is going on? Yes. Yeah, so actually, growing up, I've always had regular menstrual cycles. They weren't heavy. Um, you know, I know a lot of uh, friends of mine, they like always had heavy menstrual cycles, severe cramping and things like that. I was fortunate growing up. I didn't have that. But once I turned like 30, 31, it was like everything started shifting. And I just thought it was growing pains and dismissed it because like I said, oh, I'm just, you know, going through a bad menstrual uh, cycle. But then my cycle started skipping. And I didn't know when they were coming. So, like, I would get one June 1st, and then the next one would be, like, August 28th or be, like, August 15th. So it was never consistent, even when they did skip. So, even now, were you ever se sexually active during that time, on and off? Well, that was that's part of the reason why I neglected also my OBGYN appointments, because I was not. I was celibate for <laughs> about, about okay. nine years, ten years. All right, let's pause right there. Let's pause right there because I've been in this in the big C land, in the celibate land. If anybody else has been in the celibate land, raise your hand. If you haven't, it's okay. No judgment. We ain't judging any warriors over here. But <laughs> that is a misconception that when you're celibate, we mm -hmm. sometimes don't go to our annual gynecological exam because we're thinking, well, ain't no business going down here. Exactly. But that's not true. We always have to get our checkups, right? So you were celibate. So you're thinking... There's no reason for me to be pregnant. So maybe these skips are what? So keep right. going. And I wasn't sexually active. So I knew wasn't anything going on down there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I was, you know, just being nonchalant, going through life, living, and my stomach was growing. Um, and what I was causing more um, damage um, to myself because what I started doing, I started wearing multiple pairs of Spanx. And almost passed out again just at the club because you know you have so many layers of the Spanx and it's tightening but even if I put on multiple layers of Spanx it did not hide my stomach my now stomach did you know that, that did you know these were fibroids at the time or did I still you, didn't know so no. you thought maybe my body is changing mm -hmm. my metabolism is changing so do you guys hear that so we weren't going to the gynecological exam because we weren't sexually active we understand but we know that's not the way to go but your body was changing your periods were heavy I assume possibly mm -hmm. your periods yes. were heavy and because your body's changing you're using more spanks to to figure that whole thing out but there was an underlying condition going on so yes. when when did you start to have the question mark of something might be up so honestly it wasn't till that until that flight <laughs> like all just aside it was not until that flight <laughs> and <laughs> okay so and take us take us to the day were you on your cycle before you boarded that plane i was Okay, but so take us to the day. Mm -hmm. Normal, everything was good. And literally, like, as soon as we, like, took off, I don't know if it was the air pressure. And I started cramping. I started getting very claustrophobic. Phobic. I started sweating. Um, I asked for some Sprite. And it literally made my stomach turn. I was like, oh, no, that's not it. Um, and I started getting very dizzy and lightheaded. And then um, I started bleeding really, really heavy. Like, I kept going back and forth to the restroom. And so uh, 
I was so clammy. I took off my socks and shoes. I took off my hat. I mean, I had a sew in. The, the top layer was a mess. And yes. I was like, I don't care. And I ran to the back to the flight attendant and like did a wall slide. And she was like, I literally jumped over to two people and just like literally ran down the aisle because I was like, something is wrong because I was like, I feel like, oh my goodness, something is happening. I've never experienced before this before. I don't know. And at first they dismissed me. as like, you can go back to your seat. And then the lady saw me and I like slid down the wall and she's like, oh my gosh, catch her. And then when I woke back up, I was literally in fetal position in the back of the plane where they do the snacks and everything. And they had oxygen masks on me. Like I said, I had no socks and shoes. No. So, okay, so let's go back. Teron J is on here. Hi, the rapper and the famous actress and all that is on there. Hey, beauty, how are Hi. you? Thank you for joining Warrior Wednesdays. So you were, you, did, you said you did the wall slide. So you knew something was wrong. You left your plane seat. You went to a flight attendant. You knew my body is not right. Something yes. is terribly wrong. You had your cycle, but you weren't really thinking that this is what was taking you out. And then you actually did a wall slide. And the next thing you knew, you're waking up in fetal position and there's oxygen on you. And I'm on top of the flight attendant's lap. And also another thing, my, so I don't like to wear jeans on flights. I feel like they're just so uncomfortable. Um, so I, I always wear yoga pants. My pants felt like I wore a pair of jeans that were at least five times too small. So I'm sitting there holding my pants out like this because it just felt like it was just, just taking everything out of me. I was like, oh my gosh, what is happening? But that was all the cramping and everything. Um, and then come to find out, I actually had a uterine cyst that ruptured on the flight, which caused the pelvic bleeding, the abdominal pain, the um, dizziness, the massive bleeding. Uh, everything that I was feeling was associated with the uterine cyst just going through the uterine lining and rupturing on the flight. And the air, the cabin air pressure it was, is what sort of made it rupture. <laughs> so the uterine cyst, the cabin air pressure. So had you not been on that flight, this could have been progressing and progressing inside mm -hmm. of your body. Like at some point, there something was going to happen right. that, that was going to have to get you to a doctor and one of the things that we do here on warrior wednesdays is we share these stories mm -hmm. because we want to give people as much information and transparency as possible so that they may not wind up in an emergency situation you know what i mean do not so recommend <laughs> we, we don't recommend but so what happened and and so the air pressure makes makes it rupture now you don't know that when you're laying on the plane so what's going through your emotion at this point, you don't know what's going on with you. Are you bleeding? Do you feel the moisture in your legs? Yes, I'm bleeding. I'm shivering. Um, they're asking me first. They thought it was um, like my, my blood sugar was low. So they tried to make up this like very sugary drink. And like I said, I tried that earlier with the Sprite. And I was like, oh, no, it's about to make me throw up. Then they thought it was like anxiety. And then I had to tell them I'm on my menstrual. I don't know if that's contributing. I don't know what's happening. And they thought I was, had anxiety because I was flying by myself. And I'm like, I then flew across the country, the world by myself. Trust me, it's not anxiety. Right, <laughs> it's, it's right. Some, it's something. It's something deeper. Um, mm -hmm. to the point where I like woke like once I came out of it, and the oxygen definitely helped. I was like, where's my shoes? Oh my gosh, where's my hat? But yes, I was so scared because also when you look out in the clouds, and I'm like, how much longer do we have to be up here? And they're like, oh, the flight is another two hours. I'm like, I and I look out and it's just like empty space just got I'm like oh no I, I I'm I don't think I can make it this long I right. cannot it was it was so scary um like, so what literally. was the next what was the next move after the plane so you're terrified you're back there with people you don't know mm -hmm. you're bleed you're bleeding and you don't know what's wrong with you and you've mm -hmm. just fainted on a flight so already like hallelujah Jesus that you woke up but what happens when the plane lands what was the next step so the next step so luckily like I said once it like went through I was fine again. And that, that's part of the confusing symptoms because I was just like, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. But they called the ambulance on board. They're like, you were not fine. Trust me. If you saw what we saw, you were not fine. But they did notice. They were like, you look better because I was flushed. And they were like, you're shivering, you know, but they were like, you are not fine. And we're still calling the emergency, you know, the ambulance. So I'm like, no, guys, you don't need to do that. I promise you I'm fine. Um, but they checked like my blood sugar, like my blood um, pressure and things like that. And then I called my OBGYN. Um, and she was like, okay, well, let's get you in here right, right away. So went there the following morning 
And she was like, yes, this is what's happening with your body. This is why this, this, and that. And we started scheduling um, a, a surgery. But also- Okay, so that, let's go back. So you go to the OBGYN and did they do an ultrasound or did they do- Yes. What, 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 what was the test that was done that determined that you had uterine fibroids? They, they did an ultrasound. Okay. Um, but also with that, so like I said, me still not taking things as seriously as I should have. I waited a year before getting my surgery. So, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, that's okay. We're not gonna we're not gonna hold you accountable at Warrior Wednesdays because what we're gonna do is say thank you for going when you went. Because okay, one of the things okay. that the one of the things that I never want to do here is to shame us into thinking that, you know, the way that we determine how to take care of ourselves is wrong. We just want to supply the information. And that is the truth. The truth is you were like right. I got some time. I'm gonna wait, and thank God, God was on your side with that. But one of the, but what would what would you say to a woman that is in a situation like that? I think my oh my ring light just went out. My beauty light just went out, y'all. You still, still look okay? good. You hey. still look good. <laughs> okay. Um, but what would you say? Would you ever advise a woman to wait that long, especially after an incident like that? No, um, definitely not, because uh, a variety of reasons. Um, one of the reasons why I decided to like, oh no, this is affecting my quality of life. Uh, severe bladder pain. There were times where I couldn't go to the restroom because it was so painful. Something that take two sec two minutes, it was like 30 minutes and I'm in there like, oh gosh, oh gosh, please help me out. I couldn't feel my bladder sometimes. So as I'm trying to make it to the restroom, I would just have an accident. I actually had an accident in my nephew's bed and I tried to blame it on him. <laughs> and he was like, oh no, auntie. Uh <laughs> He's like, auntie, you did that. That was not me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a grown woman, but that's so embarrassing, you know? And just right. not knowing when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen. Um, another time, I remember I came to visit my family and I was in fetal position the entire weekend because it felt like I, I felt the fibroids sort of rolling. So every time I moved, it was sort of like they were shifting as well. So like those aspects of, the, of affecting quality of life and even just the self-esteem aspect is just a whole nother story. And I guess... And I want to get to that. Let's go to the physiological really quickly, just so the people that may not know. So fibroids can, they can put pressure on your bladder. They can put yes. pressure on your, so sometimes some women will, will urinate frequently. Sometimes there's been cases where women cannot urinate and they actually have to go to the doctor to get a catheter because mm -hmm. there's so much pressure on there. Fibroids can also sometimes mask themselves as back pain. Yes. And we think that we are just sore when really we might be growing fibroids in the back because fibroids can grow inside the wall of the uterus. They can grow inside the cavity. They can grow on the outside. So just so you guys know, there are many, 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 many symptoms to fibroids. And based off of what you're saying, you had quite a few and you, and you knew at one point that, that you had these symptoms. So we had some accidents in the bed, but now let's go to back to your point about the um, the self esteem mm -hmm. and and what it feels like emotionally because I think that this is one of the reasons that you know that phrase suffer in silence and I know we say it here a lot but it's really like we're just I I, I don't often like to say suffer in silence as much as I like to say like we are journeying in silence sometimes mm -hmm. we just don't know right how how to take all of this in because our bodies and our emotional state work hand in hand and right. so. Tell us about what it felt like, what what it felt like to wet your nephew's bed, like what it felt like emotionally for you to put those spanks on all the time. Like, let us know. Oh my goodness! First off, embarrassing with my nephew, and mm -hmm. even just when I was here, like I said, just trying to get to the restroom, and I have a five year old niece at the time. She's like, "What's wrong, TT?" I'm like, "Nothing, nothing." And then she looks and she's like, "Uh," I'm like, "Just go in the other room, you know, <laughs> just go in the other right. room." TT's okay. Um, and then the the lingering uncertainty. Like I said, although I waited a year, I was it was just always in the back of my mind. Oh gosh, please don't let me get on this flight. I still have severe anxiety from like to this day because I don't sit by windows. I have to sit on uh, the aisle seats. I'm always still worried about like, oh my gosh, can something happen? Because mm -hmm. it was so traumatic. Uh, going out with friends, I'm constantly like, do I look okay? Oh my gosh, my stomach looks big seven. Oh my goodness, can you get this? Can you get that? And then just also buying like larger size clothing because I always just felt like, ugh. I look a mess. Also, that negative self-talk. Um, and then buying more darker clothes because, right, buying uh, darker clothes because I don't know when my menstrual's coming. So mm -hmm. I don't want to be wearing white. And then I'm like, somebody's like, ooh, <laughs> you might want to change right. that. 
So I was buying right. darker clothes, larger clothes, and just always constantly like this and, you know, always uncomfortable with myself, wondering, ugh, can they see that I look this way? Or so is your it going to happen today? Your whole life pattern, mm -hmm. right? How you shop, where you go, what you're going to do is all based around these fibroids and how they are affecting your daily life. Yes. So yes. what everybody needs to know is that this is a process, right? It's a process of accepting it. And it's a process of deciding when you're going to have, because the myomectomy surgery, is that what you had, the myomectomy? Yes. Mm -hmm. So myomectomy removes some of the fibroids um, by clipping them out and taking them out, you guys. It is a very rough surgery. It's not an easy surgery to have. It's not an easy surgery to recover through. It's it's an ordeal. So it's scary. You don't just wake up one day on Monday and say, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and get this myomectomy done on Thursday. It, you really need to get yourself prepared for what you're going to endure. So tell us about the decision making process. It's time now. I've waited a year. I need to get this done. Well, you know, also, I think to, to that point, I waited so long also because I was a bit nervous. I've never had I was running away from it. I'm like, oh, okay, so we know the problem. Let's see if we can, you know, do this on our own. <laughs> run away. <laughs> Let me just run, run away from it. I know yeah. what I have. But I've never had I never had a major surgery before. Like so this was my first time. And then when I finally did get the surgery, it was during COVID nineteen. So that was scary. Literally they just let my sister drop me off and then she just had to keep rolling. Like they had somebody out there to keep and I and I turned around and was like, So what do I do? Like, this is it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm in there by myself to have mm -hmm. the surgery. And then when I woke up, my doctor, she was she was honest with me. She was like, everything went well. But I do want you to know, this the surgery was scheduled between two and two and a half. You know, when they say the scheduled procedure, because this is the um, average time. So, well, wait, before you go, do you know how many fibroids you had? So, okay, so I, when I went originally, I had two in September. And okay. then in June, uh, later that year, uh, the following year, I had four. When she went inside, I had six. So do you guys see that? So we had two in September. Mm -hmm. When you went back in June, you had four. Mm -hmm. And after the myomectomy and the doctor told you it was completed, six were actually there and removed. So you guys yes. understand that um, getting, you know, if you have symptoms of fibroids, if you are having urination problems, if you are heavy bleeder, if you are cramping a lot, if your hair is shedding, if you are exhausted and if you have not found out whether or not fibroids runs in your family history or whatever getting an ultrasound or getting an mri is how you can determine whether or not this is going on in your body because they grow and they are fed by estrogen so that's what people need to know there is a food supply it is estrogen mm -hmm. that grows fibroids inside of your body so now you had now what were the sizes because we talk about fibroids you guys can be the size of a pea they can grow to the size of a melon or even larger. So what were they telling you the sizes were? Somebody here says, I recently had surgery and it went from six to 25 during Ooh. surgery. That's Fit Girl Lioness. God bless you, Fit yes, Girl Lioness. Yes. So what were the sizes that you were going through? So mine's actually ranged. Mine's, my first one was big as a lemon, I mean, a melon, and then it went small to a pea. So they were just varying in size, literally okay. with the ruler. Okay. Uh, so they varied in size. So we had a bunch. Somebody else, Harrisol79. I'm just calling it out because she is uh, recovering um, mm -hmm. from three fibroid surgeries and just had one past Monday. So we wish you a happy recovery with that and the wellness. Yes. Um, so now tell us. So the doctor comes in the room. Yes. And you have a successful, you have a successful surgery. And then what does she say? So what she said, so she shows me the picture. Um, and like I said, one was huge, like a melon. It was so thick. And I'm like, how long was that that blood sucker that I was calling just growing inside of me? And also the size, it's not like necessarily about the size in terms of how they affect you because the smallest one, that's the one that was giving me hell. That's the one that was sitting on top of my bladder applying pressure, the smallest one. The it wasn't smallest the huge one. one. Yes, the smallest one. But, I think, but overall, like you said, exhaustion and everything else. It, they all contributed to everything that I was dealing with. Um, but the procedure was supposed to be two to two and a half hours. And my sisters were getting nervous because they were expecting a call within the two and two and a half hours. So after the third hour, the fourth hour, and the fifth hour, they're like, wait a minute, because they can't be at the hospital during COVID-19. Right, because it's COVID. And so they, yes, so they're calling the doctor's office. But she, was, she said, um, 
the way that your your fibroids were growing, you know, your uterus ended up being deformed, like your organs, it just pushed up against everything. So when they cut me open, they didn't know what to do, where to start. Everything was sort of mashed together. She was like, everything was deformed. So they had to sort of move organs around to get to the to the fibroids and just yes she said everything was in there deformed and then also i had a cervical polyp so they had to go through vaginally to get that out but wow. she also said it was completely blocked vaginally the polyp was so large that it blocked my cervix so they couldn't get in vaginally and they couldn't get in with the incision so they had to think of another game plan because everything like i said was blocked disformed disconfigured and she was like but we cleaned you out. I had uh, fibroids on both the inside of the cavity and outside the cavity, in addition to the uh, the cervical polyp. Yes. Yeah. Right. If y'all don't throw up some strong hands for this woman. So, you know, and, and so this is this is what is so important to, to learn from this is, is because while you were going through the process of the weight, there were so many other things going on in your body that you didn't know. Thank God that you had a good surgeon and someone that knew what they were doing that could mm -hmm. go in there and, as she said, uh, clean you out. But I'm so glad that you are sharing this with people because if you are not ladies and gentlemen, if you're on here that love somebody that has ovaries, if you are not being proactive about your health, the health of your womb, the health of your ovaries, please, we like, you're getting a bunch of strong hands on oh, Sarah, which I love. <laughs> but we, we are, she is here sharing this with you today. The stories are being shared so that we can encourage you with the truth so that you make sure that you go get checked. Should you have any symptoms or any family history, go get checked. We, we do not want to have emergency after emergency. And Lynn is going to mm -hmm. be on and tell us about hers later. But this is, we're sharing this truth so that everybody is aware of what can happen. So we have fibroids, we have a polyp, and everything is clean. And then what does she say? Then she goes on to say, you know, if you wanted to get pregnant, tried to get pregnant, it would have never happened. She was like, it was no way for, she was like, or she said it would have resulted in a miscarriage. Miscarriage. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> so that I think that's when it sort of hit like, whoa, I'm, I'm being superficial. Like, oh, I'm gaining weight. Oh my gosh, I went up a size. And it was a lot deeper. It was, mm -hmm. it was a lot more intense than what I was like. I was, like when she said that, mind blown. I was like, excuse me? Right, <laughs> right. So she, and then she said, you know, I've cleaned you out. But she did also warn me that there is a possibility that they can grow back because we don't know how, you know, the, um, why they grow back, why they even grow in the first place, why it just affects black women um, it, more. It, it, it does affect black women more. And if you guys have been on Warrior Wednesdays before, you know that I talked to Dr. Cindy M. Duke of the Nevada Fertility Institute, and she's John Hopkins trained. She's Yale trained. She's the only doctor that I talked to here on Warrior Wednesdays. And she's made it clear to us that they do grow back in five years. So... You need to be proactive about mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. that because I actually have a cousin. I'm going to share this, but I actually have a cousin that has to have another surgery and it's five years to the day. And nobody told her that they grow back and that they grow back. Usually they know within five years. And so here she is on her five month, five year anniversary, like to the month and is now being told that another um, myomectomy is, is needed. So I want to Boy, you and everybody else to know that if you have fibroids, it is a very, very high likelihood that they are going to grow back. And so you need to make a proactive plan about that. So then after hearing all of that, what was what was her recommendation to you? Um, well, when I told her what is dating in COVID-19. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is dating? In, what, yeah. what is that? Because she was see, talking see, about if you want to get pregnant, that you should probably consider yes. doing that sooner rather than later. Like, right. right. Mm -hmm. She said, next step, let's try to get you pregnant. And that's when I said, what is dating in COVID-19? But right. also, that's how you and I formed our friendship, because I reached out to you. It was like, hey, can we discuss freezing eggs? Because that never crossed my mind before. Never yes. crossed my mind. Yes. So, Yes. And yes, and it was a lovely conversation. And I also I often tell this to women, you know, I froze my eggs because of a relationship that botched. And some women freeze their eggs for different reasons. But I, I do feel like if you're in a situation 
where you've had a surgery and someone's telling you you need to get pregnant right away and you're like uh first of all i don't have the person i don't have the plan i don't have the plan i don't have the money i don't have the whatever Mm -hmm. i always wonder why they don't just say or freeze your eggs it should be like part of it if it's something that you want to do having kids or if you don't know if you want to have kids yet and so we talked about that freezing egg process and what it was and 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 you'll decide what's right for for you to do but just know that there's options Yes. You know, in, there's yes. options in between, which is a good thing. So what do you want? What do you want the people here to know? Like based off of your experience, what do you want them to know? Those that may be going through a myomectomy recovery or going to have to have a myomectomy or have fibroids and don't know what's going on. What do you want them to know? Well, one thing in terms of just recovery, although, you know, a few weeks you, you start feeling, oh, okay, I feel back to normal. No, you still need the full six to eight weeks to recover because it's been a lot of times people's stitches have busted. It's been internal bleeding. There's like your body is still healing. I think I still wasn't like, I still didn't understand the magnitude of what my body just endured in the surgery. And then later looking back, I'm like, wow, I I was really cut open on the table. I have a scar to prove it. So it's a lot. So listen to your body. You know, even if you're just like, I'm just going to sit on my computer for a couple of hours. Still that interconnectedness with the mental, emotional, it's all still triggering with your recovery period. Also, just listening to your body um, and not just surface level, deeper. Like, okay, um, pay attention to, yes. (laughs) That's key. Not just surface level, she said, y'all. She said deeper. Keep going. Yes, um, just in terms of being proactive and just taking, I guess, notice if you're skipping menstrual cycles. If you notice, hey, um, I can't urinate. (laughs) It's painful for me to urinate. Like those, I just feel like when that happened, I should have been running to schedule my my surgery, you know? Um, Yeah, and and that's key. And one of the, you know, when you said noticing your period, you guys keep a menstrual journal. Mm -hmm. That's something that Dr. Duke talks about, writing down the dates. Like, I'm gonna be honest, I think that's my mom that says, yes, listen to your body and Stewart 830. I'm going to be honest. I still have my mother in this, in this world. And she actually calls me and tells me when I'm going to have my period because she has my period journal. But these are the things that we need to know. Also, anemia is a very <laughs> big sign that there might be fibroids going on. So you guys need to keep a journal of your health. So, And, and then also just ask your provider questions. Uh, I feel like that was another big thing. I, I, kind of didn't know what to ask. I'm like, okay, so I have fibroids. Okay. So what, what's next? What, what do you recommend? I'm like, I, I'm like very clu- clueless, oblivious to what's, what's happening. So she literally had to sit me down like, this is what's happening with your body. This is why you need to take it seriously. This is why you need to take these precautions. These are next steps, your options. But these are, you know, the results that can um, come from it if you decide not to go through if you decide to go through I'm like oh okay and then I started researching and then I was able to start formulating questions and being uh, open and honest and like transparent with talking to other women about it and this is a point I love that you said this Dantera because then you said then I started researching and then I started formulating questions and then I could be open and honest and this is something that we talk about always on warrior Wednesdays it is you know faith without works is dead And, you know, here we talk about faith, we talk about all of those things, but we also have to do the work. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what we what we fail to do is doing the research, getting second opinions, third opinions, or having Mm -hmm. candid, transparent conversations such as this. It is up to us when you guys go to a doctor, whether it's a specialist or whether it's your regular GP, have no shame in writing notes before your appointment of what questions you want to ask because you will not remember everything. We're in the time of COVID, so right now people can't go with us to the doctor. But one of the things that Dr. Duke um, suggests that we do is to have an accountability person with you because you know what? Talking about this is scary. You can go into the doctor and be like, I really just don't want to hear that that pea-sized thing grew into a melon today. I really can't take the drama today. Exactly. So br- bringing a friend, bringing, you know, somebody that you trust, a trusted family member with you. And because we are in COVID, don't let that stop you, okay? Because I'm very resourceful. I will FaceTime somebody in a doctor's <laughs> appointment. And I mean, yes. like, put, put your mask on on FaceTime. I don't care. But I need support. So do not feel like you have to go to these appointments and do these things on your own. And if you don't think you're a good researcher, call somebody that you know that you trust and say, can you help me 
figure out what's going on with my body. This is what I was told. So yes. you guys, I just want, I really wanted to, to, you know, hyphenate the point that you said about researching, formulating questions, and then being able to talk to it, um, talk to people about it and be transparent. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, absolutely. I, look, I will admit, I think I was a bit ashamed in the beginning, like not knowing the proper questions to ask my doctor or not even understanding or knowing my body. I'm like, I'm a grown woman and I don't know what to ask. I yeah. don't know what's happening. Uh, but I'm the same I, way. I was, yes. I didn't, I didn't know until I froze my eggs that you're born with as many eggs as you're ever going to have. Yeah. I was 37 years old. I didn't know what a follicle was. I didn't know. Here's what I'm going to say. This is a little tidbit. You guys, I, I thought we lose one egg a month that that's all we lose. Mm -hmm. We lose all of the follicles that the body released in that month of ovulation. So if your body released 25 follicles, only one of them is going to mature and go into the fallopian tubes to be fertilized. And if fertilized, implant itself and have a pregnancy. If not fertilized, then we get our period. And I'm thinking that's the only little egg we lose. No. If I release 25 and one matured, how many do I have here left? 24. That's 24 follicles that could have become eggs. All of those are lost. Wow. You are, not, you are losing about 300 follicles a year, even yeah. though you're losing 12 mature eggs. So when I talk to you about freezing eggs, mm -hmm. when you release those 25 follicles, that's what the body does. What the hormones do in freezing your eggs, what IVF does, and we talked about this a little bit on the phone, what mm -hmm. IVF does is it tries to increase this number from 25 to, let's say, 35. And instead of maturing one, we want to we mature all 35. That's what those injections do in the body that are going into your stomach, into, in, into your abdomen here. So it wants to mature all of them as much as possible. And then at the right moment, after all the ultrasounds and all the blood tests and the doctor decides, now we do the trigger shot, they're going to do the, put, get, do the procedure to take it out. They're going to put a catheter in there. You're under, you don't know. And they literally remove all of these mature eggs. And not all of them will survive the freeze. So maybe out of that 35, maybe mm -hmm. I got 22. Who knows? Right. But what we don't know, it is called follicular atresia. So what we don't know is you don't just lose one egg a month, you guys. You also lose the follicle. So that is why when your doctor told you to get pregnant right away, that is why freezing your eggs is a good option for you mm -hmm. because you might want to put some aside, whether you do one cycle of freezing or more. And I don't tell women to freeze their eggs. I tell them to understand what their ovarian reserve is and their overall health. And that is what you have helped us do today by talking about your overall health. So I want to say thank you. Can you direct everybody to the article and where they can read? So you guys, Santara, like I said, is a journalist, Ohio native, correct? Yes, Youngstown, Ohio. Hey. <laughs> hey. So she is a wonderful woman. And so you're still on this journey because this happened in COVID and, mm -hmm. and you have you have healed. Isn't she beautiful? Y'all give her a bunch of hearts. Thanks. So <laughs> can you tell us where everybody can find you, where they can follow you, and where they can read your article where you really lay out beautifully about your journey with fibroids? Yes. Okay. So everyone can follow me at Dontara Terrell. Um, and that's just my first and last name, D-O-N-T-A-I-R-A -A and Terrell, T-E-R-R-E-L-L. And then the article that I wrote about my fibroid journey, which is my first, but not going to be my last. Hey. Is, uh, <laughs> yes. Is uh, sistersletter.com. And it is under the health section. And you'll see it right there. And the title says, uh, I learned I have fibroids after I fainted on the flight. Here's what I wish I knew. Here's what I wish I knew. Well, we thank you for telling us all that you wish you knew, sharing that story. And we just want to bless you, you guys, more hearts in your recovery and in your continued journey, you know we're here at Warrior Wednesdays for you. And we just thank you for being so very, very transparent with us. I yes, love I thank it. you for using your platform to educate so many of us. There's so many people in the comments like great information. Oh my gosh. And just relating to everything that we're speaking about. So yes, thank you. It is our <laughs> truth. So thank you, beautiful. You look beautiful. What y'all don't know is our parent and I, we had to do our hair. We had to do right. our, we had to do our corn. <laughs> We were Ooh. talking. I was asking her, girl, you ready? She's like, I'm trying to get these braids right. And I was like, I'm putting in my last twist. Right. <laughs>
<laughs> but we let's got lay it. that down. <laughs> Letting them edges down. Well, listen, I'm so glad you survived that flight. I'm so glad that, you know, I'm not glad you fainted, but I'm glad you fainted because mm -hmm. it made you aware that there was something really going on. And I know that moving forward, you're going to continue to talk about it. So thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. And we bless you and we love you. And we'll see you again, hopefully, on Warrior Wednesdays. You'll come yes, back and share definitely. some more. Love y'all too. Bye. All right, Silas. Bye, baby <laughs> Bye. girl. Oh, she's so beautiful. Okay. Um, how wonderful was she? Give her some more hearts. Don Tara is just a, a lovely, lovely woman. And it's really great to talk to people that just experience things. You know what I mean? Because they're able to like, they're really, they're, their temperature is really hot with it. What's really going on. But how scary is that? To faint on a plane, to, to hear this information. She waited a year, but she got it done. And she's on the other side and will continue um, her journey. So thank you, Don Tara, for sharing with us. So next up, if you have not requested to come in, Lynn, I need you to because I don't know if I see your, you there yet um, if you need to come out and come back in. But I'm going to introduce you guys to Lynn Wachter. She is a friend of mine. Um, and I have known her upwards of like 15 years, maybe, maybe 10, 15 years or so. And she had an emergency myomectomy. We're going to talk about it. I actually visit her in the hospital when it happened. Um, and it's, it's a story. And nobody can tell it better than her. So let's bring on Lynn, the survivor of the crazy, um, but very, very scary. But we've come. I love you. Hi, how are you? I am okay. I'm all right. How are you? Great. And I'm just, I'm so, so blessed to see you. You know, I just was sharing as you were connecting that when you had your emergency myomectomy surgery that I came to the hospital to see you. I didn't even know much about fibroids at the time, but little yeah. did I know, or did I think <laughs> that we would ever be here sharing it publicly, but you are such a rock star of a sharer. Uh, I, I, I love you. <laughs> thank you. I love you back. Um, and it's, wow. Yeah, I, I guess we, ha we have been friends. We've known each other for 15 years. Sorry, take these off. I'm going to need to put them back on again because I have a goal. But um, it, yeah, it's been 15 years. And it's been four years since, um, yeah, since the, since the surgery surgery since, okay yeah well, I, since all let, of that's happened let's rewind for everybody everyone's saying such beautiful women the both of you Don Tara and Lynn yes oh, they it's so are. nice I let listen I got my little um my Florida Evans pick and pat I did that for y'all you know <laughs> like I, I was gonna put a hat on and I was like no they're gonna get this Florida they, Evans we're gonna get they the gonna real get it, we're and y'all get... gonna this is what this is what this COVID life is like right here this is exactly <laughs> how she was in the hospital room okay so <laughs> Lynn, okay. I want to talk about your period take me back Okay. Um, your monthly period. What has it been like before? Before you knew you had fibroids, what was you going okay. through? Much like Ontario, I had the same experience where I did not have a terrible period growing up. Um, it was fine. Uh, my twenties, and I'm just going to preface this now. <clears throat> I'm going to get this out of the way because yeah. I've been reluctant to publicly talk about my age because we're in this business where even now, where I'm not in front of a camera anymore, I'm behind it. But there's so much judgment when you, when you um, are restarting your life or rebuilding or reinventing yourself and having to start at a certain place. So I'm like, fuck what you heard. Sorry to, for swearing if that- It's uh, okay, it's, it, it, it needs to happen in this, go. But a Hefe is 45, just turned 45 this year. So how you doing? And um, guess what y'all, I'm 45 so, too, okay? So yes ma'am. We are, so this yes ma'am. This is, this is what 45. Yes. <laughs> My, just prematurely gray and 45, but whatever. We'll do that later. Right. Anyway, point is, um, nobody ever told me when I was growing up really about what, what exactly changes with your period. Now, my mom and I, as you know, we're like best friends. I talk, about my mom, I talk to my mom about everything. She's, oh, she does not hide anything. It's, my mom is dope. But <clears throat> growing up, I got my period, my mom explained things, it was fine, but then nothing was discussed. And it's not, um, this is not about my mom, this is just about generational. Yes. Um, they don't talk about why your period changes. 
You're just told that it does. Girl, just wait. It gets worse. Wait till you hit 35. Wait till you hit 40. It get, and all you hear is that it gets worse. Right. And so when it starts to get worse, all you do is sort of endure it because that's what we do as Black women. We endure. We were given. It was passed down to us. And we were told, okay, it gets worse. Now, I'm going to sidebar and say, here's where I was a dumb dumb in that I did not pay attention to red flags. And this is just a little cautionary tale. Just understand that if you, are, if you realize that you have missed red flags in one part of your life, you've likely missed them in other parts. So just understand that. <clears throat> Lynn is so about if to you, preach, y'all. If you've Lynn missed the red flag preach. in one part of your life, you've probably missed it in others. And the red flag that I missed is that my mother had a tumor on her uterus. She had fibroid. A fibroid that sent her into an emergency surgery. I was in middle school when it happened. It was a whole thing. And all I knew is that my mom had a tumor on her uterus. It was never just, it was ne- we never talked about the fact that it was a fibroid, you know? It was just, she had a tumor on her uterus and there was a lot of stress happening in her life at that time. And I get it. In our lives as a family, it was all happening, fine. But as I'm getting older and my period is getting worse, I am not thinking about talking to my mom about exactly how worse. So for I, as much I as we talk- to- I need to pause you just for a second, because this morning, my mother and I had a talk about whether or not she had a partial or a full hysterectomy. I remember something when I was in middle school. So what you are talking about right now, and I want you guys to hear this, is because it's so very important. Mm-hmm. We don't we don't go directly to the source. If your mom is still living or if your aunt's or your grandmother is still living, we don't go directly to the source to say, hey, is there anything that I need to know about anything that went on in your body that may have been passed down to me generationally? We have the memory. I remember my mom had a surgery. I remember it was in her lady parts. I remember, you know, her having to recover. But as a grown woman, I wasn't asking her, what exactly was that? It just in case. So I love this point that you're making. Your brain, the takeaway, because for me, I, it happened when, I don't know, I was in the eighth grade. And so my takeaway was that I, you know, as a family, I had, you know, I have three other siblings they are older, but <laughs> as, what I remember is because that's when I really learned to cook, right? Because I was cooking for my mom and I, I knew how to, I learned how to make liver and onions and I learned how to make spinach and all these things that were important to my mom's diet because of this surgery. Iron, 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 anemic. Do you know, sidebar, my mom, we used to make fun of her before this. And see, this is how I really, I, this is why I'm like, Lynn, you are such a dumb dumb. Years before this, my mom was eating starch, Argo starch right out of the box. Later, her doctor told her, your body was craving iron and you just needed to get it the best way you can. And starch is actually chock full of iron. That thing, that box of starch actually has more iron in it immediately in your system than eating a spinach salad, right? So my mom was literally craving iron to the point where she would get a box of starch with a spoon. And my mom, my mom is like jack of all trade, master of none. And I remember her, um, she was making something. I, I think if, I don't know what she was making at the time. My mom, like I said, jack of all trade, master of none. She was making something. And so she was just with a box of starch and a spoon. Just getting wow, And wow. we used to laugh at her like, what is this craving? And we laughed and you know, joked about maybe she was pregnant and she was like, no, and she wasn't. So those are the things that came back to me. I will tell you that later when I was in the hospital bed getting my fourth blood transfusion. Right now. Okay. So, so, you, so. You just, so did y'all just hear that? So give her some strong arms because she just <laughs> kind of slipped that in her fourth blood transfusion all because of fibroids. But so now we, we've, so. Made, we've made the point about going back, which is a excellent point, which is why I love you so much. So your periods are changing. They're changing. And what's and happening? I am, they're starting to get, I'm starting to cramp a little more than I used to. Mm-hmm. Nothing terrible yet. And I'm, my periods are starting to get ex- excessively heavy, like progressively excessively heavy and then heavier. And by that point, I was in my, I was in my late thirties. I was 35, 30, 35, 37. They were getting heavy and all I kept thinking and I you know I remember sort of kind of saying oh yeah my periods are getting crazy and they're like yeah girl wait just wait just wait till you hit 40 just wait and it's something that happens with black women when we take when we pass down this information no one is actively trying to harm you and my mom was always available for questions always my mom I could ask my mom about anything talk to Mm -hmm. her about anything 
but I wasn't being specific about what was going on with me. Mm -hmm. I was just mm -hmm. saying my period was changing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being super specific. So of course, the older women in your life, the girl, yes, and it does this and this, and the cramps get worse and this. So you think you're going through what every woman in your age group goes through. Yes, and even in the younger, even in the younger demographic, even yeah. our young teens, sometimes in, in our homes, it's like, well, she's she has a bad period. Go, oh, that's just your period. That's something we hear a lot. That's yes. just your period. You guys need to know this medically. I need to say this medically. If you or any woman you know from 11 years old to whatever is having horrible periods, horrible cramps. It is not just her period. There is an underlining condition. We can not keep writing things off. You are not supposed to not be able to go to school, not mm -hmm. be able to walk and play sports with your period. You are supposed to be able to do all things. If it lays you down in bed, there is something else going on. And so here's keep the talking. funny thing. Mm -hmm. Mine wasn't laying me out with pain. Mine was I was, I had become like a Jedi master. I'm going to make a lot of nerd references, P.S., because I'm a nerd. But um, I was like a Jedi master in crafting my life around my cycle. Like, is it a party? What kind of party? How long is it? How late is it? How big of a purse can I carry? Because, uh, yeah. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing started to happen and it starts to happen slowly. Like you don't, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens slowly where you start to realize these things. The other thing that you don't think about, which I urge all of you to pay attention to, pay attention to your hormones because your fibroids affect your hormones directly. Mm -hmm. They are directly related to your estrogen, right? And as women, we get labeled as emotional creatures and all of this. But what happens is when you are younger, you will get catapulted into premenopause when you have fibroids because your body is freaking out. Like something's growing, your body's trying to figure it out. There's an excessive amount of estrogen. So your body is freaking out. So now you're experiencing mood swings. And the kind that a woman who is going, who is in premenopause would be experiencing and nobody was thinking about that. Right. I thought I was perimenopausal, which is a thing. All my friends tried to tell me that it wasn't a thing. Right. They all tried to be like, girl, you tripping. You're going to have a baby one day. Don't worry. And I was like, this ain't about a dude or a baby. Like, this isn't like a woe is me moment. I'm telling you, I'm perimenopausal. Because I want to set whole ass human beings on fire. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> of your hormones. And there are people on here, just so you there, know. There's listen, ladies. When I tell you I'm a... <laughs> Lady Tina says that was me. I suffered through this my entire cycle. Another one is saying I had a hysterectomy because mine was so bad. That is Mickey. We give you love. Mickey's so dumb a heart. But yes, the hormones, the hormones. Somebody's asking, hold on for a second. Well, we'll get to questions later, you guys. If you have questions, uh, write them up and put them in the question box, okay? Because I can't read that fast. But so yes, you thought your premenopausal. I'm going to speed this gone. Yeah, I'm, I'm I need, you, I need you to go to when you found out you had five boys. Okay. So here's what happened. So my period is doing weird things. And when I say weird things, I mean things that I should have been checking out. But at the time, the other thing that was happening is I was doing my struggling artist thing. And so I didn't really have a full-time job and I didn't have insurance. And so I wasn't going to the GYN. Also, like not super sexually active at the time. Girl, talk to you. That was a terrible relationship. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> anyway, so that wasn't happening. And that was what it was. Uh, and so I wasn't going and I didn't have insurance. So I really wasn't going, right? And and then things started to get weird. And when I say weird, I mean weird with a beard. I mean, I was on, I was working on a show and I was on the set and I had to keep going to the ladies room because I had to keep changing. Uh, I, I couldn't even wear tampons anymore. It got to the point where I was doubling up on tampons, but then I was like, I don't want no toxic shock. So what do I do? And so then you have the ginormous ones and you're like, oh, okay, this is, and then one day I went to the ladies room and something came out of me. When I say something, I was so traumatized by the fact that this flesh dropped out of me. Ladies, listen, <laughs> yeah. flesh, a piece of flesh. This is the first time, piece of flesh that was like this big, okay? And it was like ahi tuna, okay? It was like a little, it was like, it was like a piece of ahi tuna. I'm not lying to you, piece of ahi tuna. And I was like, say word. And there was so <laughs> much going on in my life right now. I was like, ooh, okay. I'm like, like, what is this? And it's basically, I was, you, it's basically blood clots, you guys, that are actually, it was blood what? clots, but it was like, 
wait, wait for it. So I was like, ooh, guess what? See, I can't really do this right now because I got to get back in there. So we're going to handle this later. You be all right. Woo, woo, woo. And so I left, figured it out, made it happen. Moving on, the day, I, the day I, that ended up being up in the hospital. So I was temping, trying to get this full-time job because I was like, being a struggling artist is hard. And I didn't have insurance and whatever. I have an audition before. So I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my audition first and then I'm going to go to work because I don't already told them. I have worked it out. Girl, I get in my car and I was living in those fields and the audition was in Hollywood. I get in my car and I'm on my cycle and I'm like, oh, this sucks because I know all the precautions. I have my diaper bag, that's what I used to call it, my diaper bag of things. Um, cha change is not just with millions of pads, but changes of panties, a change of pants. Like you had it, you, you had to, it, it, become, it becomes the norm to carry your like period wear like yes. all around the city, right? Because yes. you know that your periods are changing and they're heavy and the da, 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 da. Yes. So I was like, okay, here we go. So I'm in the car and I will never forget where I was. I was on Franklin. And I was getting to the light at Franklin before you get to that uh, Gelson's or whatever that's on the right-hand side. <clears throat> I was coming from the east. And when I tell you a sharp blinding pain hit me, when I say still blinding that I... I when I, they say blackout, I didn't blackout, I whited out. It was that blinding where I could not, it was just bright light. First it was the stars and then it was bright light. And I clutched the steering wheel and I could have gotten into an accident because I don't know what happened as I was oh. driving, trying to have the pain stop. And I was like, <sighs> okay, okay. And I was like, okay, okay, you're fine, you're fine. My dumb ass, instead of being like, something's wrong, go home. No, no, no. A heifer went to, the, went audition. to the audition. So I get to the audition and I'm like, did I leak? All I kept thinking, not about my health, was did I leak and will someone see? Okay, right. let's pause right here. And the reason I want to pause right here is I think it's very important because we have all um, done this. And, and for the women that are on here, especially the, any age, I don't care. Sometimes we go through a traumatizing experience and we forge through and we keep going to do what we are meant to do. And we do not pause and we do not take care of ourselves emotionally, mentally, and physically. The reason I can relate to what Lynn is saying and the reason that I needed to stop this is because I was actually assaulted. I am not going to call it just grabbed. It was an assault on the, in broad daylight on La Cienega Boulevard. I am okay. I am fine. Where a man grabbed me to try to go under my dress from behind. I'm saying this publicly and I know that it's going to be posted and this is the thing. But it's important for me to say this because after I screamed and yelled and wailed at everybody in the street for help and he ran and got away, I continued to go across the street to my audition. I forged through and I did what I had to do and it wasn't until I came out and got in the car and cried to my mother on the phone who lives in Philly who was on La Cienega Boulevard that very next morning at 10 a.m. Because I called her, it was probably 5 p.m. Philly time. She was at the airport by 7 p.m. Philly time. She wasted no time. But why I wanted to bring this up based off of what you said, Lynn, is that it's trauma. Mm -hmm. The pain that you felt physically, the assault that I incurred emotionally, it's trauma. And oftentimes you don't, know how to respond and so mm -hmm. you keep going it is nothing to be ashamed of it is nothing to feel like you're doing something wrong but i want to point it out because if lynn's words and my words stay in somebody's heart and in their soul and god forbid something happens to you i want you to know that in that moment hear us when we say stop and take care of yourself whether that is going to a doctor calling the police calling a friend Stop where you are and take care of yourself. You do not have to forge through. So just yep. understand what trauma does. And it's important to know that something like Bob fibroids is traumatic. It's important <laughs> to know that this is not just like, girl, I was bleeding. Mm -mm. Your body, and your body is fighting some <clears throat> a foreign thing that is literally, that literally almost took Lynn's life. Like this is just to get a little serious here. Lynn almost lost her life. She's super fun. She's super cool. But this was a real thing that happened. So I just needed to pause and say that to everybody. Now let's continue. Yeah. So you go to the audition. And I go to Yeah, I go to the audition. Thank you for pausing and saying that because, you know, it came back to me later. 
after I tell you the story, it came back to me later that uh, someone who I used to call a friend was like, oh, she didn't actually almost die. And I'm like, okay, uh, anyway, so yeah. like, whatever. Um, happened was I go to the audition and I do what we all do when we're trying to forge through you know like you were saying it's like okay fine I go into this bathroom and I try to pull it together and I make sure I'm not leaking whatever and I go and do these stupid hindsight even at the time I knew it was dumb mm-hmm. as this is dumb like your your body is and I felt everything like even after that pain I had to I the minute I got into that audition and I ran into the bathroom it was just like an onslaught of blood. And I was like, okay. And luckily I got into the bathroom and you think that that's okay. And so you, it stops for a second, long enough for me to go and do this dumb audition. And I, I, there was no way I was gonna get the gig anyway because my mind wasn't even there. So I get back in my car and I'm like, okay, it's cool, it's cool. <clears throat> I'm going to, now I'm gonna head to work. I'm still a dumb dumb. I'm gonna head to work. So as I'm starting to drive to work, not a dumb dumb. You're traumatized. No, I, I'm not I a dumb dumb. I love you. Traumatized, but I'm I not gonna let you get away with that. Oh boy, wait. you are in trauma. You are in shock. I was in trauma, and I was so used to. Whew, that's a whole other black woman thing. Figure it I, out and keep going. That, that's why I stopped. Just figure it out and keep going. That's I was why in that I mode. Said, yes. I was in. I was in that girl. You be all right. Suck it up mode. I gotta get to work because at the time the position was temporary and hadn't quite become permanent yet. And so I was driving and, and I just started bleeding, like excessively so, to the point where uh, it, it was, it, it had come down the, the inside of my, of my pants, right? And I was like, I have to, and it started, like it was just right here. And I was like, I gotta go get, I gotta get stuff, I gotta go. And so I went to uh, uh, CVS. Mm-hmm. And I got out of the car. And the minute I stood up, it was like, and when I tell you it was down to my knees, like blood stains down to my knees. And I could barely walk, but I was like, you have to do this. You have, you have to go. And so I'm walking, I'm hobbling around CVS trying to get stuff. And so I get stuff and I have to stand in line. And you know, and then suddenly like the blood, not to get graphic, it's warm, yeah, no, but yeah. it's thick. But then it also gets cold. Like yeah. once you stand up and air hits it, so it's cold. And now I have my pants sticking to me. And now I know that anybody around me can see what's happening and there's nothing I can do, right? So there is that like, this is, this is it. Like it, it's here and there's nothing I can do. And I was like, oh shit, oh shit. Okay, you're cool. You got this, you got this. So I go, just also tell you something. I laugh at myself. I'm still bleeding. I get my stuff. People in the CVS are like, mm, and I was like, yeah, it's fine, lady stuff. And so I get the car. And I was about to sit in the car and I realized I'm going to get blood all over these seats. I pop the trunk and go get something out of the trunk and sit it on the seat. I get home, like literally at this point I'm shaking and I realize it's the realization that something is terribly wrong. Wrong. And and I don't, like this is not just my period, something is wrong, wrong. And so I have to, I don't know, you remember where I used to live in Los Feliz with all those stairs, right? So I park the car and I like, I walk myself up the stairs, my dumbass. Just take a shower, change your clothes, and get ready to go back to work. When I say my, I mean my silly. Like you go, you go into. I was in that weird. Thing you only you, had one more dumbass before I came through this camp. I know. I'm sorry. So uh, I had such blinders on, and there was such a lack of 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 under a, a lack of wanting to truly acknowledge what was happening, right? Mm-hmm. That's what it was. It was a lack of wanting to truly acknowledge what was happening. Because in your brain, you're like, no, 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 no. This can't be happening. Not like this. I feel like the chick in the matrix. Not like this. Not like this. Like I just, so I crawl up the stairs. I get in the shower and I'm standing in the shower and I'm just bleeding and I'm not, it's not stopping. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And I put my hands on the wall because I can't really stand up. So I put my hand on the wall of the shower and I'm like, oh, and then this searing pain hits. And I'm shower, tears at this point. And then when I tell you something the size and shape of a ahi tuna steak, it was this big, y'all. I'm not kidding, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it was this thick. I know mm-hmm. it was this thick because I had to pick it up to remove it from the shower and flush it down the toilet because it was, then clo- it was now clogging my shower and my shower was backing up. 
that's how thick it was. Not to get super graphic on you guys, but that's that's what was going on. So I was like, okay, the bad things. And then and then I broke, broke. Like I wouldn't let myself break, break. And then I broke, broke. I pulled on some manner of clothes and I crawled into my friend, who is now my roommate, uh, Carrie, because she was living there at the time. I, and I knew she was working from home. So I was just like, all I could get out was, Carrie, it was like tears. And she was like, what? And I was just like, ah, ah, and I kept trying. Her mom's a nurse. So she was like, holy shit, what the fuck? She calls her, she calls her mom, Cheryl Joe. Cheryl Joe literally saved my life. So Cheryl Joe was like, uh, okay, you need to uh, go quickly, hospital, something, no, urgent care, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, fine, whatever. So one of my other friends who was there, I was like, I'll drive, cool. And my, uh, when I was describing to Carrie's mom what was happening, she was like, okay, it sounds like you've got it. I don't even have to be there to sound, to know that it sounds like you've lost uh, so much blood. You're going to need to get a CBC when you get there. Make them give you a CBC test. And I was like, a what now? And she said, a CBC test, it tests your, your blood levels. Like where your hemoglobin and your um, hemocratic is, right? Um, you're going to need that because it sounds like there's a lot of blood loss. I'm like, fine, fine, cool. I go to this urgent care, because again, struggling artist broke, no insurance. I go to this random urgent care. They were so cold and so terrible. And I was trying to tell old boy, and he was trying to tell me that I had everything but, was at, but what was actually going on. And then he said, ah, you could have fibroids. And I was like, well, can you check? I'd have to do an ultrasound. Can you do that? I can't really do that while you're on your cycle. And I was like, you don't understand. At this point, my cycle had gotten to the point where it was lasting 14 days, sometimes longer. Yeah. Not that's consistent, it. not consistent heavy bleeding for 14 days, but it would not stop. But that's another it, symptom of fibroids, you guys. If you have yes. long lasting periods, sometimes women have bled for 30 days straight for a whole month. You straight. shouldn't even be spotting. Yeah. If, if, you, if you're not on some sort of birth control or something or some medication that makes you where that's a side effect, you shouldn't even be spotting. That's true. After your cycle. You just shouldn't be at all. So there should be no blood and if there is run. So anyway, so I'm, I'm sitting there feeling like, I can't even describe the feeling, the feeling, feeling um, uh, helpless and dismissed and not worth the time. Uh, Cause this man was treating me like I was just some random chick. He asked me about all kinds of sexually transmitted diseases and if I was pregnant and whatever. And you know, and it's also as a black woman, that's also traumatizing because that's their go-to. You pregnant, you got some, you, you do whatever. And I'm like, no, this is. Disproportionate healthcare for black women in this country. We, that's right. a whole nother episode. So, but yet, so I, he sends me packing and I'm like, okay, shit. And anybody who knows me knows I'm the type of person that will fight. <laughs> but at that point, I didn't even know what, what to fight for, how to fight. I was just, and I was exhausted and scared and whatever. So I get in the car and I'm like, Carrie's mother calls me. What happened? And I was like, well, they said this, this, blah. She said, did you get the CBC? And I was like, no, I, he didn't take it. She was like, I don't care if he didn't take it. Turn around right now. Go back and ask for it. And by law, if you ask for that test, they are supposed to give it to you. Key, Do key, it. key point. Did you guys hear that? By law, if you ask for it, what is it? The CBC test? Yes, it's a CBC test. They are CBC, supposed to give it they to are you. Post, by law, they're supposed to give it to yes. you. So this is where Carrie's mom, the nurse, was saved so, my life. Saved her life. And this is why, you guys, that whole phrase, suffer in silence thing. But this is why speaking up, calling somebody something is going on with me i'm scared i don't know what it is is so important because you turned around you went and you got that i CBC went back test. but wait i got the cbc test when i asked for it dude said why and i said because i want it and right. he said well it's not gonna matter i mean if you don't know your levels now it's not gonna matter what they are before and i was like listen i need and all i kept saying was i didn't even understand the 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 specifics of why I needed the test, I just trusted. Trusted what you my said. My friend's my mom. Miss Nikki and she was like, says it's a complete, complete blood, count. blood count. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. I didn't know. I didn't know. Well, but it varies I, from state to state, says Michelle Polster. It's so. like, listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm in California, by the way. So by law, they, they were supposed in to give me if I asked yes. for it. Yes, in California. Yes. And so I asked, I demanded it. I said, I don't care. I want it. He was like, oh, okay, fine. Gave me the test. I was like, F whatever upset, went, had a steak because I was craving iron. iron. 
went to bed, woke up the next day, went to work. I was at, on my lunch. That doctor from the urgent care called me and was like, uh, yeah, look here. So, um, so we got the results for your, from your test back. Um, so we're going to need you to go. I'm going to need you to go to the emergency room like right now. And I said, excuse me? He said, I'm going to need for you to, uh, and I said, what are you talking about? And he told me that um, my test came back and, and, but he started asking me questions first. How long have you been having this problem? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, I told you all of this when I met with you, what is the problem? And he said, your count is low. I was like, my count? What are, you, what are you talking about? And he was being very vague. I realized now he was feeling shitty and realized that I could have sued him technically for malpractice. Yes, yes. Um, because he sent me home. And I said, fax me the results. I needed to look at them so I could call Carrie's mom and say what's happening. But he said to me, it's, it, actually, you need to go to the emergency room. I was like, what well, you mean now or like at my lunch? Like, can I go after work? Like, what's good? Because <laughs> I was at work like, I right. can't just run into the emergency room, sir. He said, no, 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 take this paper. Go to the emergency room. They will see you immediately. That's how dire this now, is. Now, Rocky, your best. Hi, Rocky. We love you. Hey, Rock. I just saw her beautiful performance in Sylvie's Love. She was amazing, amazing. That sultry blonde wig and body. But she says, can you say what the blood count is supposed to be? Do you know mm -hmm. offhand? Yes. So I'm getting to that. So he, I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't understand. And Carrie's mom then explains it to me. Because I said, I'm supposed to take this and they're going to see me at the, at the thing? He was like, yes, tell him you need a blood transfusion. And I was like, wait, hold up, what? Terrifying. telling me this. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he right. said, I said, what do you want me to do? Just roll up like it's McDonald's and be like, yeah, give me two uh, pints of O positive and uh, like it's a McFlurry. Like, what, what are you talking about? And he said, right. no, ma'am, you need to go right now. Because at first he was wishy-washy. Right now, later, and he said, no, 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 right now. What the hell? Send me the document. Send me the document. I still didn't understand the numbers. I was trying to get to Carrie's mom. Carrie's mom was like, go to, the, go to the ER. He's telling you to go to the ER. You need to go. I get to the ER. I hand him that paper. When I tell you it's the fastest I had ever been seen in the ER, come to find out what was on the paper, the number he was so concerned about was a five. That is your hemoglobin. Your hemoglobin normal is 12 to 14. They recommend blood transfusions at nine. If so they recommend nine, transfusions at nine. You're at a five. I was at a five, but that was from the day before when I made him give me the test. So you could be lower. They gave me the test again in the ER and I'd already dropped to 4.6, which meant that I could have bled out overnight. Oh my. Steadily dropping because I was still bleeding. So Carrie's mom was like, you could have slipped into a coma. You could have bled out overnight. That's what could have happened. If you were already at a five, and by the time this happened, you were 4.6, that meant by the end of that day, you could have, you could have, we it, have it a all could have been bad. Lady, Mickey, Mickey, that says she was at a four. So this mm -hmm. is something that is unfortunate, but a huge emergency situation. And so what well, I know a black woman who got down to a two. Uh, it, it's okay. crazy. And it's, this, it's nuts. This, and because this episode is about fibroids, you guys, this is what we need you to know, that this is how bad it can get. We're not saying it to scare you. Well, actually, we are. We're saying yeah. it to scare you straight Seriously? into being mm -hmm. proactive into um, your, your health and what's going on with your body and to know the things that are not normal. So as Lynn, because we're, we're going to have to wrap it up soon, but I just want to like, just go back to, I just want to say that all of the things that she experienced, the heavy bleeding, the, the tissues that were coming out, going to the to the uh, urgent care and being talked to dismissed. crazy and, and, uh, and dismissed and all of these things, being afraid she's going to bleed on the car seat. This was all very, very scary, very, very traumatizing. So cut to, let's fast forward to the fact we're that gonna, now we, you had to get a myomectomy, correct? Fast forward, yes. I, I went in, they gave me four, I needed four blood transfusions because they kept saying that it was like putting a um, bucket into a water, uh, into a, putting water into a bucket with a hole in it. So they kept trying to give me blood, but because I was bleeding out so terribly, they were, they had to like figure out a fix in order for, to get my blood count up so I could leave the hospital. So at four blood transfusions later, they decided after the third blood transfusion, they decided to, um, uh, pump me up full of hormones.
so I, ha I was pumped up full of estrogen and all these hormones to help stop the bleeding, right? So it was kind of like giving me like a, a shot of birth control or something. And so they did that. And then I had Dr. Horrible who came in, who was some random ER doctor who basically looked at me and was like, so he wasn't an OBGYN. He, he, he didn't specialize in women's health. I think he was a cancer doctor, which is lovely for him. But he came and his bedside manner sucked. And he scared the shit out of me because he simply told me, wait, so you're how old? You've never been pregnant? You don't have kids? Oh, yeah, you just might as well get rid of your uterus, whatever. So stop, when a doctor, stop, wait, stop. no, no, pause. No, no, wait, pause. When a doctor, and Rocky was there for this part. Rocky remembers this. This doctor was stood in my face and said this stuff to me. And Rocky was just squeezing my knee. Now, granted, I was hopped up full of all Hormone. the hormones. So I had all the feelings that ever existed and I was feeling them all at the same time. And then I had this man stand in front of me and tell me like, and say as callously as like, what? Wait, how old are you? Wait, you've never been pregnant? You, you don't have any kids. You don't have any kids. You've never been pregnant. Yeah, you might as well just take it out and just whatever. I was like, okay, wept, got over it. It's, it was fine. I managed to get out of the hospital after all of the, um, the hormones and the whatever. And so they hopped me up full of hormones and they said, you have to schedule a surgery because what they found when they did the thing was like um, four fibroids and they weren't huge, but they were, they were there. Cut to, I find my doctor who's lovely, who I love him. He's so sick of me because I see him every 15 seconds. I have insurance now and I go to the doctor every five minutes. He's like, girl, if you don't stop calling me and I'm like, but Dr. <laughs> but Benini. not that doctor. The reason that I said stop, yeah. stop, stop is because I'm so glad Rocky was there because this is what happens, especially to women of color. Mm -hmm. um, the disparity in healthcare and someone dismissing your womb, dismissing the rest of your life, dismissing mm -hmm. you because of age or because you do not have children yet. Mm -hmm. And I am so glad that you had someone there by mm -hmm. your side to mm -hmm. protect you. Because when, and I know that you can protect yourself mentally and intellectually, but when you are lying in the bed and all of this has just happened to you, and we see these disparities going on with women of color all the time, it is imperative that we speak up. It is imperative that someone is there to say, no, 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 you will not take her uterus. You will not, not dismiss her uterus that way. You will just not, not dismiss her as a woman, as a person yes. that way. And so uh, you guys, this is still happening. It still happens. Yes. It's part of the reason that I have Warrior Wednesday, when I have Dr. Duke, so you guys can get the information so you are not misinformed even by a medical professional mm -hmm. or someone that discounts you because these are things that we need to know. So have your person, you know Have a I mean? person. Have your person with be your, you. Be, be your, your advocate, advocate, but also have an advocate with That's you. right. That's because right. Because when I got, when my doctor was recommended to me, Dr. Benuni, I would, I, I love him to the cows come home. He was like, no, 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 you're far too young to just get a hysterectomy. That'll catapult you into menopause. It doesn't make any sense. Right. This is what he does. Like, fibroid surgeries is what he does. He was like, we cannot, we, we're going to have to open you up. This is a myomectomy. We're, we're going to have to cut you C-section style, and that's just the way it is. And I was like, cool. So we went on this journey. I'm, I trusted him. We had a great conversation. He was like, I got you. You're going to be fine. My mom flies out because my mom was not having it. That's a whole other conversation. My mom was like, um. Yeah. So my mom flies out. I told you what my mom told me the night before my surgery. Yeah. She said to me, my mom calls me baby woman. This is funny. Um, my mom said, baby you guys, woman. Get your, get your tea. Wait, wait, before you do this, because get, <laughs> get, you guys get your tissues. Cause we're going to wrap up in a little bit, but get your yeah. tissues ready because I would read it the text, but I can't cause I'm on my phone with the live, but no, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to read, I'm going to, so I don't screw it up. I'm going to read the text that I sent to Kelly because this is what my mom said. You guys to need to hear it. So as she, because for, go ahead. This, this part is important when I get to like the fact that, yes, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. They went it, they opened me up. They found eight instead of four. There were eight. There's some, the reason why I had excessive bleeding is because some were encroaching into um, my endometrial cavity. So there wasn't, it wasn't so much about, about the pain as much as it was about it encroaching into the endometrial cavity, cavity, which is what was causing all of the bleeding. And, you know, so I had eight fibroids removed and removed. So when I got up, when I woke up, he was like, I'm sorry, a couple of things. Yes, you can still have children. Um, if you want, if you decide you want to get pregnant, you cannot have natural childbirth. You will have to have a C-section because... The fibroids were so embedded that I had to manipulate the lining of your uterus in such a way that it thinned it out too thin for you to actually endure labor. So if you do decide to have a baby, that's what, and that was four years ago. Right. 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 So I was like, okay, fine. 
Now cut to, I am faced with, and, and, and you know, the recovery was what it was. And Don Terry was right. Pay attention. It is six to eight weeks. People can try to tell you, I got up and I was fine. That's cool. But listen to your body. Don't let anybody else who felt whatever they felt and felt better and was up and moving around sooner. Don't let them do that. Good point. This is Great a major, point. this is a major surgery. So you listen to your body. Your body. When, I you, when I tell you how many times my mama sat me down and went old school Southern on me, she was like, here's what we gonna do. You ain't gonna get in the shower. I don't care if the doctor told you, you can't get in the shower. You're not getting in yet. You're gonna, <laughs> there were all kinds of things that my mom was doing. And I was like, okay, cut to being like, okay, and understanding that they can come back. And I now have them coming back and we'll talk about that later. But yes. my mom said to me, like after all of this, like the, it happened, it was rough. Six weeks, my mom was there for the entire six week journey. She, my mom is a G, <laughs> she is the best. Uh, and it took me six to eight months before I started to actually start to feel like myself. Yeah. Because Dr. Mnuti was like, not only did you experience a physical trauma, there was also an, something emotional that emotional. happened to you because mm -hmm. you were catapulted into early menopause yeah. and you didn't know it. Like your, your hormones were going nuts. You were trying to figure out your life at your age and do your own thing. And all of this was also affecting it. Yeah. But something else, when I said earlier, if you're not paying attention to, to red flags in one part of your life, you're like, you likely have missed them in every part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when the fibroids happened and my mom was like, see how you ain't paying attention to these red flags, but I don't need you to look around at the rest of your life. What, mm -hmm. what, what red flags have you missed? And I was like, okay. And then she sat on the edge of my bed. I'm going to read. <clears throat> she said, um, baby woman, I want you to listen to me. I know you're outspoken and opinionated and not one to hold your tongue. But if I know one thing, I know this, you've been sitting on some shit. Shit you didn't even realize you're sitting on and holding in. And you're doing it to serve other people. But that ends tomorrow. Let me tell you what's going to happen. After that doctor cleans you out and you're recovering, you're going to take a good hard look at what happened and you will decide to never again let anything take you back to that place. You will make the decision to care for yourself. Put yourself first. And when you do, you will notice the people you will lose along the way. There will be people who will celebrate your choice to care for yourself, and there will be others who will not be able to handle the fact that their needs no longer come before your health and well-being. Mark my words, baby woman. The minute you prioritize yourself, things will shift, and it ain't going to be easy, but it will be necessary. That is what my mama said. And when I tell you she said the shit, <laughs> I was like, Okay. And when I tell you for the past four years, I have lived that journey and understanding that my fibroids are coming back, I had to pause. And I had to ask myself, what's happening? Are you missing some red flags? What's going on with you? Pay attention. What's happening right now in your life that these things are coming back? And at first I was like, they're coming back. And my doctor was like, let's give you an IUD. And at 45, to have an IUD, I tried it because I didn't want the fibroids to come back. But the reality is, this is no longer about preserving my uterus and not wanting to go into early menopause or whatever. And the idea of children and, and this, and people saying, no, you can still have a baby and whatever. Listen, it's not about having a baby. If I want to be a parent, I can be a parent. There's a difference between having a baby. Do you want a baby or do you want to be a parent? Those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And when I asked myself, do I want to be a parent? Sure, I could. I would love to be a parent. Do I need to have a baby? Do I personally, me, need to have a baby? No, I don't need to have a baby. I would love to nurture a soul. I would love to be a parent. I'm an auntie and a big sister and a bunch of things to a lot of people. And when I get this IUD out on January 7th, because it has wreaked havoc on my lady parts, mm -hmm. let me tell you something right now. <laughs> Um, I'm like, no. And if my doctor says, well, we got to deal with some things to not have these fibroids come back, then I will deal with them. And it won't make me any less of a woman. And it won't mean that I won't be able to nurture other souls and others. And I am an auntie and a big sis and a mentor and whatever to a lot of people. And that makes me feel great. And if I can be a parent to a 10 year old or 15 year old, somebody who's in the system who would like to 
not be in the system anymore. And that means that if you're 15, okay, great. If you're 16, that means two years you're out of the system. Why don't you come stay with me and let me help you? And that way, when you go off to college, you have some place to come home to. You can I, come home to okay, a place okay. on the college break. The, now, I'm going I'm to stop for you. you for a second. I'm going to stop you for a second. Okay. Because I, I, this is why, first of all, thank you to your mother. And thank you for sharing her beautiful words with us. Because she said it to you. She said it to her daughter, to her child. And now you have said it to us. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that. I also want to say to you, this is why I said you had one more time to say my dumb ass before I come <laughs> through the camera. It was, it's not, it's not about cussing on Warrior Wednesdays. My grandmother taught me how to cuss. She told me if you're going to say the word shit, you got to say it like they're going to smell it. So <laughs> it ain't that. Um, but it was because what my mother, who's in the other room, would say is be careful about how you speak about yourself. Yourself. Mm -hmm. Be careful about the language that you use mm -hmm. about when you describe yourself and when you describe your life. Because the woman that went through what you just described to us mm -hmm. and that shared that those words from your mother and then ended it with saying, I know how to be a parent. And if there's a child that needs me, I know how to nurture. If there's someone in the foster care system, they can come be with me. It's no dumbass. <laughs> so even in jest, and I get it yeah. because we're cool. I get <laughs> it. But even in jest, I, as your friend, as your advocate, need you to know, ain't nothing dumb and ain't <laughs> no ass about any part of you, your journey, and getting all the way over here. Because what everybody on Warrior Wednesday is watching right now doesn't know is that we talked about this last night, about adoption. And girl, maybe mm -hmm. I would adopt somebody when I, that's 10 years old because everybody wants a baby, but who wants a kid? And we talked about that as women of a certain age, sharing the same mm -hmm. age as, 40, as 45. Hi, the Princess Warrior, I see you up here. And so I just want you to know that I thank you for being the smartest, most brilliant, <laughs> brave, encouraging, open, um, transformative women that I have ever known. I often say this to my mom. God knew who to choose for certain battles and challenges. Because That's I don't true. know if I would have made it through what you made it through. I know he would have given me the strength. But he gave it to you because you're able to speak it to us in this way. So I love you and I honor you. We have a couple of questions. We are like super over time, but I'm going to see what we can answer. And then I just want to get your last words, okay? As I continue, okay. to, thank, as I continue to thank you. Um, <laughs> let's see. I'm, you're not going to give me cereal here. Well, um, my mother, this is Ann Stewart, says where they're severe... PMS. PMS. Let and me tell, tell you. Yeah. The, okay. So um, any kind of dog food commercial, first in the tears. Um, <laughs> I wanted to set whole ass human beings on fire. <laughs> like yeah. whole human beings. I was like, um, the, fa the fact that I am not in prison right now or I'm not face facing any kind of charges because my general personality is to like, I might have to make physical contact with somebody. <laughs> That's just like the baseline. I'm working on it. I'm older. It's fine. It's, it, it goes away. But at the time, I had to, it was a struggle to not reach out and touch somebody, yeah. to not put hands on people. And <clears throat> that sounds like something funny or whatever, but it was, it was a oh, real. Man. Listen, let me tell you something about this girl from Baltimore. <laughs> The fact that there are people out there that are not bleeding by my hand <laughs> right. from that period in my life is a is huge i don't even know what kind of miracle and, jesus and, was like let's not and it's very real you guys you guys need to know that your hormones it's a it's a very real thing they they really do affect your emotional state they go ahead what were you gonna say i was gonna say no i'm piggybacking on what you said because this is important and i will i will say this you know people joke about women's hormones it happens to men it happens to them differently they just deal with it differently as in the loss of their testosterone will result in a lot of like performative toxic masculinity right <clears throat> that's what happens when they're when their testosterone dips a lot of things happen they hide they do whatever women your hormones 
as my friend Carrie was saying, our brain decides the way our perception of the world, right? Your hormones directly affect your brain. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a hormone imbalance, it directly affects the way you perceive the world. This isn't just, oh, I'm irritable. You've made me angry. And why did you chew that way? No, no, no. This is the way that I'm seeing the world is altered. And what we don't realize is that even women who are practicing celibacy, when I um, uh, purposely or not on purpose, either way, like yeah. if, if you're in a space of celibacy, <clears throat> that might be going too far, but you know me, Kelly, this is what I do. Yeah. Um, you got to figure out how to pleasure yourself because in doing that, that release, it activates certain hormones that help that keep you healthy. When my doctor was like, what's happening? I thought you said you was in a relationship. I was like, please not. Let's talk about the toxic crazy that was that. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, I'm not understanding why your estrogen levels, levels dipped. And I was like, we'll talk about that later. That's another bottle of wine or something. But it's very but, true. Yeah. But it's, it's true. Like it, it is, it, it means that nobody's saying that you got to go run up on every dude that you see. No. Or every woman that you see. No. You just have to keep, that is such a healthy part of, of, of women and femininity and who we are as, as women and what, what means, what matters to us and what is physically and you know, important. And, and, it's, and it's an important part of our balance because you guys, a lot of your yes. hormones come from your pituitary gland, which actually, when she talked about emotional, which actually is located, it's like the base of your, of your brain and even yeah. the anti-malarian hormone that tells the ovaries to release the follicle that tells the follicle yep. stimulating hormone. It comes from here and sends the signal here. So your hormones are very, very important. They do, you know, kind of run the show. And one of these days we're going to have Dr. Duke back on. And I just want to have a sex talk, like, like a whole, like listen, a whole sex talk because we, we need to um, be able to own our sexuality, whatever it may be, to own our pleasure, however we receive it or give it to others or to ourselves in a very, very healthy way. So thank you for saying that, Lynn, because it's a, it's a part of our life. It's a great point. We talk about health. And guess what? Your sex is health. So it is, it is a part of the whole thing. But let's see if we have time for one more question, and then yes. we're going to wrap it up. And we have here... How do we convince our doctors to test our estrogen levels? That's First of all, you need to girl. change, sorry, you need to change your doctor if you have to convince your doctor to test your estrogen levels. That's true. That's, I'm going to say that first and foremost. If you have to convince your doctor to test anything that you have a question or a feeling about with your, your, your lady parts, your feminine health, anything, or your health in general, not just your feminine health, if you have to convince them, you might want to consider getting another doctor because a doctor worth their salt will not question a woman who wants to test her estrogen levels. Yes. yes. Testing your estrogen levels are important. I had to go get my fertility levels done. My doctor did not blink. I was like, what's good? How they doing? Are they good? Are they powdered? Are they government eggs? Like where, how we living? And right. He was like, yeah, don't freeze them now. It's too late. And I was like, that's fine. That's fine. He was like, I mean, you could get pregnant, but, uh, but he tested it. He didn't dismiss me and tell me that it wasn't important. So, do not listen to that doctor. I urge you to seek a second opinion. And even if you love your doctor, at least seek a second opinion about that part of mm -hmm. it. And yeah. then, it, it, yeah, change your change doctor. doctor. Mama Sue says, change your doctor ASAP and she don't play. And that is, and that is the truth. And you guys, you, we all have to be the advocates of our own health along with bringing advocates with us. And listen, I always say this about physicians, find a physician that speaks into your listening. Find a physician that says things in a way that you understand that makes you feel confident about whatever is going on. And if someone does not make you feel confident, find a second opinion, a third opinion. I don't care how many opinions you have to get, because even though we talked about myomectomies today on this fibroid warrior Wednesday, there are other things that happen and, and, turn, and other procedures that can be done, um, like a uterine fibroid um, Embolization, I think it's called, where they actually, ablation, there's an ablation there's a thing that happens. There's a bunch of stuff. Yeah, there's stuff that that is that where they don't have to cut. There's stuff where they do have to cut. There's ways to cut off the blood supply to shrink the fibroids. It is a case by case thing. Lynn and I are not doctors. We are not scientists. But we we talked about um, you know these experiences, these emergency situations that happen today. So to Don Tara Terrell, I want to say thank you, Don Tara, if you're still watching. We love you and we thank you. Thank for you. Getting on that flight and sharing that information and getting off that flight and getting yourself better. And Lynn, you know, 
like I said to you guys, Lynn is a longtime friend of mine. I remember when I got the call that Lynn had to get a blood transfusion because of fibroids. And I was like, say what now? <laughs> and got in the car and ran to the hospital. And the way that she's making us laugh here, she was doing that in bed. And she was telling me all the situation. She was like, girl, there was a whole chicken cut that came out of me and this whole thing. But it's real. And never did we think on that day that I was visiting you, Lynn, that we would be sitting here sharing it with all of these people. And hopefully, and I know, not even hopefully, I know that your story has blessed many. And I know that it is going to encourage people um, to go get, you know, what, whatever, get checked to figure things out or say, mm, that's a symptom that I had. Maybe I had fibroids. And if we have done that, we have yeah. really, really, truly um, done our best. So tell everybody where they can follow you before I say my final thank you to you. Oh, uh, I am uh, at Coco Nerd Girl on Instagram. I'm that way on Twitter. I don't spend much time on Twitter. Um, uh, but Facebook, I'm on Facebook. I, yeah, I have no <laughs> qualms about speaking publicly about that. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody wanted had a question and wanted to send one. And if you have a question, to, DM yeah. Lynn and check out her Facebook because she has an awesome post that she wrote about um, all of this. And Lynn is a writer. Lynn is an artist. So she, and like she said, she's a nerd. So she found these really funny ways and antidotes to let you know what's going on. But Lynn, my friend, my dear, dear, dear friend who's still alive. <laughs> Yay. I almost yeah. cried for a second. Um, and who went through this thank you for letting me be a part of your life. Thank you for letting me hold your hand during that time. Thank you for four years later, sitting here across from me while you're in California and I'm in King of Prussia and sharing this with all these people. Little did we know, like I said, but um, God continues to bless you. You guys give Lynn some prayer hands to thank her. Um, I want to send everybody here a happy, wonderful, healthy, healthy, new year wish as we leave 2020 let's continue to love on each other to do better to find our new path in 2021 and i just i just i bless you all thank you lynn thank you thank Don you Tara. thanks for having me thank you so much for sharing and will you come <laughs> back because i'm sure we're going to do more i will come back i will have to tell you my iud journey Yes, we'll That'll talk be, about that's we'll a talk whole about other the episode. IUD. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Well, you're getting a bunch of prayer hands. Thank you, Nichelle Paulson. Thank Thanks. you, the, the a princess warrior to Aunt Sue. Thank to you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Kelly Stewart inspires. Yes, yeah, she's here. Uh, Kelly girl, thank you guys. Blessings to you all. We thank appreciate you, you. I will post this, Lynn. I love you. Thank you for sharing I your five journey. All right, survivor. Right. Talk soon. Love you. All right. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye baby. Beautiful. You guys, thank you. We we were here for a whole like hour and 40 minutes and y'all stayed and y'all brought some other people here. So thank you so much. I have a little bit of tears in my eyes. I'm just happy that both of those women survived those stories. And I thank you for being here. Blessings to you. I'm going to go ahead and post this. Send it to somebody that needs to know more about fibroids and needs to hear stories like this. Come back and join me in January. We have Nichelle Polston. She's going to be up next. She's our first Wednesday in January. We also have Miss Danielle Brooks. You guys might know her for Orange is the New Black. And um, she also is playing Mahalia Jackson right now. And she is going to be coming on Warrior Wednesdays on the 13th of January to talk about her emergency C-section. So look up Miss Danielle Brooks. Trust me, when you see her face, you will know her. And we have more to come. So thank you so much for being part of Warrior Wednesdays. Happy New Year, Warriors. I love you. And I will see you in 2021. And I'm going to post this right now. Like right now. So I'm saying goodbye. Love y'all. Bye.